Hello, everybody, and welcome to our ninth seminar in the C6 seminar series. My name is Al Cohen. I'm a pediatrician at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, in Toronto, Canada, and I'm one of the co-leads of the C6 seminar series. We're really excited to welcome you to this seminar series. For those of you who've never attended before, this is focused on the clinical care of children with neurodisability and medical complexity. The C6 seminar series stands for Collaborative Conversations with Families to Advance the Clinical Care of Children with Medical Complexities and Disabilities. And it's a 10-part seminar series that's graciously supported by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health in partnership with Family Voices. We're really excited to have you all join today and look forward to your participation and engagement in a, in a lively seminar. Today's seminar will focus on aspiration. We want, to, we want to acknowledge before we begin that each healthcare encounter is unique, be it brief or lengthy. And many of the topic that we discuss in this series can be difficult to address by virtue of the fact that we're addressing large gaps in, in the research. And while we cannot cover the entire breadth of the topic, we aim to at least highlight the cooperative need and value of partnerships. I just wanna make a few reminders Please remember to submit any questions or comments that you have in the webinar Q&A. Once we've concluded today's presentations, we'll move on to a panel discussion. We'll try to get to as many questions and comments as we can. Following the seminar, you'll all be asked to complete an evaluation survey. This serves a couple of roles. It, will, it gives us an opportunity to better understand how we can improve the seminar series and also uh, provides an opportunity to get CME accreditation. So in order to, to get CME credits, you need to complete this evaluation by Tuesday, May 23rd, and you'll receive details on how to claim your credits in your email. Based on the rich discussion and high volume of questions and feedback from attendees in previous C6 seminar series presentations, we have added 30 minutes to the conversation and attendees are invited to stay for a virtual coffee chat from 2 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't stay, the, ca the cafe Q&A portion will be included in the recording. At this point, I'd like to introduce our family speaker. Our aim in this seminar series is to create a supportive forum in a safe space to have important discussions that ultimately help to improve clinical care. Throughout this series, we have partnered with families because we know that family participation is essential to improve clinical care. Our clinical partners as families are involved in the care of their children 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and their experiences and perspectives matter. They matter a lot. However, by virtue of the form being large and virtual and the nature of these kinds of discussions, which involve lived examples that may resurface a variety of different reactions, we understand that these conversations may be difficult. If anyone needs any support after attending these sessions, we really invite you to reach out. The, the links will be shared with you. If you're a physician, you can go to resiliencyatascension.org and the Resiliency Training uh, Center. If you're a person who is medically complex or a family caregiver, you may visit the Four Parents website and those links will be provided in the chat box. We're really honored and delighted to have our family leader, Kathy McClelland, here today. Kathy McClelland is a freelance copywriter and marketer for pediatric healthcare and special education brands from Austin, Texas. Before becoming a mom, her work included promoting medical journals and online publications for the American Academy of Pediatrics and parenting books for Tyndale House Publishers. When her second son was born with a rare genetic condition, she was thrust into the world of special needs parenting. Her, I encourage you to look at her website, which is kathymcopywriting.com. Kathy, can you share with a group an experience or experiences in regards to aspiration that are illustrative of what that means for you and your family? And can you also please share with us what you see as implications for change? Can y'all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay. 
Um, so hi, I'm Kathy McClelland and um, my son, Nathan, um, who I'm going to be talking about today is about to turn nine years old. Um, when he was born, he um, was um, immediately showing some signs and symptoms of aspiration. I didn't know it at the time. I just knew that he was choking on amniotic fluid. And um, he had some strange uh, markings that went down his spine. They were sort of like a symmetrical ink blot, you know, that you do in preschool when you're a little kid. Um, and so I, I was a little concerned because he wouldn't nurse right away. Um, and then later that night, um, he turned blue. And so my husband, um, he pulled the call button and he simultaneously suctioned him. And at that point, um, we, we knew something more was wrong. He went up to the NICU and couldn't keep his temperature up and they began running several different tests on him. Um, so, and my husband, he is a, a PA, he works in pediatric pulmonology. He kept asking me if his cry sounded like a cat. And I kept saying, I don't know, I never owned a cat before. Why are you asking me this? But he was pretty persistent and he kept Googling things. And so I knew that, that something was probably off. Um, so over the course of the next um, several days, we learned that he had several medical abnormalities with his brain, his spine, his heart, his kidneys. And um, it, after two weeks, um, he was diagnosed with Creutzfeldt syndrome, which is a deletion of the um, fifth chromosome. And um, with all of the medical things that he had going on, I would say the, the most angst that I had in those early days was actually related to his inability to eat. Um, it's not that the medical things were insignificant, they were. Um, he has one functioning kidney and he had developed a UTI um, that caused him to go septic when he was in the NICU. Um, he had, his heart looked like it had dextrocardia at first, but it was just malpositioned. And later we learned that he's at risk for aortic dissection. Um, he had a tethered spinal cord. Um, and so there was a lot going on. He um, had to be resuscitated three different times when he was in the NICU. But I know it sounds strange to say this. The thing that bothered me the most was that this kid wouldn't eat. And I think that it's because um, there is this link um, between um, nurture and nutrition as a mom. And I could not, um, no matter what I did with lactation consultants and speech therapists, we couldn't get him to take more than maybe two mLs at a time with a bottle. And so um, pretty early on, the neonatologist started talking about a G-tube. It was completely foreign to me. I had I'd never met anyone before who had a G-tube. And um, it felt like, it, to me, it felt like we were giving up on him because I felt like if Nathan wasn't going to have the ability to eat, that something that was so basic to um, survival as a human, it, it felt like um, that we weren't fighting hard enough for him in some way. And so um, I, I really kind of pushed off the decision for a G-tube as long as I could. Um, and um, in the meantime, started to learn some more of, of what was happening with him not being able to coordinate that suck, swallow, breathe. And I remember a neonatologist saying to me, you know, the body is going to prioritize, you know, what it needs in order to survive. And actually breathing is more important than eating. And um, so just kind of starting to put those pieces together, he was actually transferred to our local children's hospital from his delivery hospital. And we had several specialists rounding on us. And um, the one that was the most helpful to me was um, a neonatologist that, that had a daughter with a G-tube. And so that conversation was really pivotal for me in saying, okay, I, I don't, we're not gonna get out of here anytime soon unless we make this decision to implant the G-tube. Um, also significant in that was a swallow study that we did while he was inpatient when he was a baby and just being able to see that it like that the formula was not going down the right way at all. Um, and so we decided to put the, the G tube in when he was um, about, I think five or six weeks old and um, continued to work with um, some of the therapists inpatient 
um, before we were discharged. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and put up a couple pictures. I'll show you. Um, that's a recent picture of Nathan in December. Um, and um, that's his smile, his cheesy smile that he makes for the camera. And then I, um, there's a couple more pictures I wanted to show you. Um, that's him doing vital stem therapy. Um, uh, that was probably a couple years ago when he was seven or eight years old. And then um, one more picture I have of him showing him feeding himself some purees. So that kind of shows you where we're, we're at now. It's been a very long journey. Um, we were, um, when we were discharged, we were immediately given an appointment to an aerodigestive clinic. Um, and that, that clinic had, you know, several special What I think we'll do just, I, I, I wanna make sure we give Kathy enough time uh, to tell a really important story and thank you for the comments in the text box about it. I wonder just, um, uh, so just in the interest of uh, ensuring that we cover all the, um, all the important perspectives from everybody, um, if we just reverse things a little bit and then we'll, we'll, give, um, we'll give her a chance, we'll give Kathy a chance to, uh, to speak to what she was speaking about, um, and we'll just reverse the order. So at this yeah. point, I think it probably makes most sense to just uh, introduce our next two speakers, um, who are Dr. Christopher Russell and Katie Pe Peck, who are going to give us a didactic presentation about aspiration. Uh, Dr. Christopher Russell, who I'm happy to say I've, I'm, I've known for quite some time, uh, is an associate professor of clinical pediatrics <coughs> in the Division of Hospital Medicine at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. He's a pediatric hospitalist who has clinical expertise in acute medical management and coordination of care of children with medical complexity. The overall objective um, of, of, of Dr. Russell's work is to improve the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of bacterial tract, uh, bacterial respiratory tract infections, including pneumonia, and uh, with a particular focus on children with complex conditions. In addition, we're privileged to have Katie, who is an expert clinician, an accomplished author, an experienced professor, and well-known presenter uh, in the area of aspiration. She's been practicing at Children's Hospital Los Angeles for over 15 years, and has been very involved in program development there, including the FEES Clinic, Aerodigestive Team, and co-lead of a pilot nasogastric for home program and growth advancement in the NICU gain initiatives. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Russell and Katie to present today. And please remember, if you have any questions, to please put them in the Q&A uh, and uh, we'll get to them after the presentation and after we hear uh, again from, from, from Kathy. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, we're pulling up our slides right now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm so glad I was able to hear at least part of Kathy's story and Nathan's journey so that um, we can get this discussion going. A lot of the um, points that she made really resonate with me as a clinician as I'm hearing, um, you know, always unique stories, but um, some very similar concerns amongst parents related to aspiration. So we termed this presentation, Aspiration Exasperation, which Dr. Russell had used in a paper he um, published. And really in doing so, we, we need to emphasize that the, when a patient is diagnosed with aspiration in the chart, what that means for them and how that might change their therapy course is really important to consider, um, making sure that it's related to an actual tracheal aspiration. And if it is an aspiration, was it from reflux or from actual feeding? Because that can definitely change the whole course of treatment for a child. Um, next Katie, slide. Are, are you seeing the full presentation or just the presenter? Well? I'm just seeing, uh, yeah, I'm seeing the presenter view with just the title page. Okay, so you're not seeing the next slide. Okay, great. Um, I think we're seeing the next slide, so maybe just uh, okay. over to present. Yeah, go to full screen. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. 
Okay, so really um, not too much to disclose other than I'm a full-time uh, employee at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and a clinical consultant for Passy Mirror, but neither of those have um, any disclosures to state. And uh, Dr. Russell, these are his commercial interests. Um, and then we are receiving funding from the foundation. And this is a little bit about the accreditation and how to receive continuing education for this seminar. And these are our objectives today. So again, wanting to go over what are the challenges and controversies related to the diagnosis and treatment of aspiration, some of the short and long-term impacts of uh, aspiration diagnosis, and what our knowledge gaps are as clinicians and service providers and teaming with uh, families and caregivers in this partnership to really guide care in pediatrics. The literature is uh, not as strong as with adults. And so what kind of barriers that uh, presents for us. So some of the discussion points I wanted to review in the time that I have with you is basically, you know, dysphagia is a fancy word for swallow difficulty and um, it requires about 31 muscles, five cranial nerves and a lot of coordination. And it's something that we always think of as a simple act because we do it without thinking. Uh, we are all swallowing our own secretions right now. And um, we do that without any conscious thought. And so not only are we constantly getting practice swallowing, but we're also, um, you know, not having to deliberately perform a bunch of motor actions. But once that system breaks down, you really start to understand the sensory motor integration required for swallowing. Um, and so dysphagia really is a complex science. I mentioned that there's a lot of knowledge gaps. For adults, there's so much research uh, with different diagnostic categories um, in terms of prognosis, in terms of management of dysphagia. And we even have a lot of uh, SLPs working in labs to determine what is normal swallowing because there is a lot of variation, even in terms of um, male versus female, in terms of how we swallow, timing of swallow. It's really important for our interpretation of when we're looking at um, the entire swallow mechanism, what is or isn't a disorder. Um, so in pediatrics, we're not going to put babies and young children in fluoroscopy and study their swallow the way that we can adults. And what that yields us is very little evidence to go off of in terms of driving our plan and keeping these young vulnerable lungs really safe. Uh, it's important to consider what is aspirated. Uh, pH levels do matter, and that's why free water for adults is often used because water is a similar pH to that of most of the body, and if it's aspirated, it's a lot less um, damaging to the uh, airways. Uh, how much is aspirated? So I know that Kathy had mentioned from the beginning, she was able to um, know that Nathan was aspirating. So how much... Um, was that and how often was that happening is really important uh, because we have to have practice swallowing in order to build our ability to um, manage a bolus, which is just a, a term we use to define the material that we are swallowing. Um, and then making certain that it's dysphagia, dysphagia associated pneumonia when you're documenting that in the chart. I've uh, mentored multiple clinicians who just ask if your child's had upper respiratory infections recently, and that could be viral. And once that's in the chart, and it could be not even associated with dysphagia, once that's in the chart, every provider is looking at that chart and thinking that there's a significant history that's going to impact pulmonary function if we are not careful. And so it, it's really important to balance uh, what questions we're asking to really get at the root of what those pulmonary changes were and why. Uh, always partnering with families, especially in pediatrics, uh, for determining the feeding plan as they are the uh, main provider. And as was mentioned, nurturing your baby is really your role as a caregiver from day one or since the moment you realize you're pregnant. And feeding is very much part of that bonding with early breastfeeding, skin to skin, all those important activities that um, 
really promote that relationship. And when we're taking that away, what that means for the family. So really my role as a speech pathologist is to provide all the education that I can and all the knowledge that I do have and what limitations uh, there are or gaps in the information that I'm providing so that the family can make an informed decision. It's really important to balance that. I'm never playing a role of telling a family what they need to do. I am just a guide and I'm a facilitator for information um, to make those decisions. As a therapist though, the last discussion point is my clinical decision-making starts with what comorbidities or diagnoses that patient has, um, not to place them into a clustered category, but because the thing that we do know is that certain diagnostic categories are more likely to have um, aspiration pneumonia, are more likely to have difficulties as a result. And so it, we can't uh, not consider that. And then that helps us predict a level of risk. So how much can we say would be safe for this child to practice eating? Um, and then with that, have an entire risk benefit analysis in partnership with the medical team and the family. We do have an aerodigestive team here too, which is really important as Kathy mentioned for looking at the entire system um, because aspiration is a breakdown of one component, just airway invasion. Whereas we have an entire aerodigestive tract we need to consider. So what's happening when the food goes in the mouth all the way through to elimination is going to impact that child's comfort with feeding, uh, their uh, safety, their overall efficiency. So looking at the entire picture. So the um, little diagram on the left is something that I made early on in my career because with pediatrics, we're really looking at the entire milestone acquisition of these children and their neuroplasticity that's all driven by experiences. So anything we do, whether it's taking away um, their ability to swallow, move, um, build the, their core strength, it all is gonna set them back in terms of their milestones and that sensory motor integration that's imperative for swallow. Um, swallow begins with the core musculature of the body. And so if a baby is not able to hold their head up or um, get, have trunk support, that is going to impact their swallow. So really partnering closely with PT and OT for developmental interventions early on, because that is all directly associated with swallow function. And then certainly neurologic status plays a huge role uh, in terms of the brain's ability to um, to trigger the swallow in a timely manner. Um, at about four to six months of age, the child goes from having a reflexive uh, swallow that's driven by a brainstem response to more cortical involvement. And so it's really important that we capture what age the child is when we're working with them, consider all of the comorbidities or diagnoses that may overlap into creating those hurdles and projection in therapy, in addition to looking at airway protection. And I added a picture of the MVSS and fees here because airway protection is not something we can determine bedside. As a therapist, uh, we go, we do a clinical evaluation of swallow bedside, but there is no way to confirm that there's tracheal aspiration unless you do an instrumental assessment. So you can see this modified barium swallow study on the left. You can see aspirated material in the airway. Um, and also this is happening during swallow. The dark is the bolus that's going down into the esophagus. So you can see that Thank you, Dr. Russell. The majority of the bolus is in the esophagus, but you can also appreciate that a lot of the bolus is behind the base of tongue, up in the um, oral pharynx and hypopharyngeal area. Um, and this, this is obviously a disordered swallow. We would not be able to tell this by feeding a six-year-old bedside that this is going on. We may assume uh, that there's general weakness and that that's what it's gonna look like, but we can only confirm this um, with a direct visualization of what's happening. And then on the right, you can see this is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallow um, image. And this is something the speech pathologists and ENT do together, which has been um, really, really wonderful because you can assess the laryngeal integrity um, and anatomy at the same time as you're looking at swallow. And here you can see the epiglottis um, is, uh, you, uh, you 
the um, follicula is on the underside of the epiglottis. You can see a bunch of green there. You can see the green coming around the sides with lateral channeling on both sides and falling. And you can see it on the level of the vocal fold and um, if you look really closely on the tracheal rings below. So this tells us, yes, there's aspiration, but you can also appreciate how much aspiration. You can appreciate the timing of aspiration and all of these things help us as therapists to determine um, what the prognosis is is and how to move forward in therapy. And with fees with the older children too, we can use it as visual feedback for them to see when they're swallowing um, or if they have fear of choking. So there's a lot of utilities there. So again, we need to be able to see the aspiration to know how to treat it. Next slide. And just as a reminder for infants, they're gonna look much different in terms of their biomechanics of swallow than an older child. So they're rooting for the nipple or bottle, their lips are pretty passive, their tongue is gonna have some stripping action to remove that bolus. And at the same time that the tongue kicks back, it's gonna create a slight traction on the hyoid bone and the epiglottis is gonna passively go over the airway, which is nature's way of protecting the airway. It's sort of an umbrella shielding over the airway. And then most, or the liquid should be going through the upper esophageal sphincter um, and also at the same time, two other things are taking place. The soft palate is meeting the back of the posterior pharyngeal wall. And also at the level of the larynx, the airway is closing from bottom them up so you have your vocal folds coming together. We don't breathe and swallow at the same time. And as Kathy alluded to, with babies, they're having to suck, swallow, breathe multiple times. Uh, and that takes about one second to do a whole cycle of that. So if their respiratory rate is over 60, they're set at a disadvantage for swallow mistiming from the very beginning. And if they have weak musculature, they might be doing suck, 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 swallow, breathe, suck, suck multiple times. And so that type of rhythmicity is setting them up for potential airway invasion because it's hard to keep up with that. Um, so as we look at the older child, you can appreciate that the pharynx starts to elongate and uh, really infants have a nice structural uh, safety net because everything moves as one when they suck, swallow, breathe, as I described. But with the older child, they're going to be chewing in the anterior oral cavity, developing what we call a bolus, where it's just a collection of liquid or food. Then they are going to propel that bolus back. And as they do that, now their whole laryngeal apparatus is going to move superior and anterior to draw open that UES um, upper esophageal sphincter and allow the food to go down. Um, their pharyngeal constrictor muscles are going to squeeze the bolus at the same time, and their airway, of course, is going to close. So all of these biomechanics have to happen in unison. They have to happen beautifully like a symphony in order for the swallow to look the way that it, it should. Um, and if anything is weak, we might have residue after the swallow, which is going to then um, be a potential cause of airway uh, invasion also. Another thing I want to mention with the fees, and since this talk is about um, aspiration, is that it's really nice with fees to be able to appreciate the reflux and the severity of reflux, because we know that that um, is much more likely to create an aspiration pneumonia. So that's a nice utility of that instrumental assessment. Um, and when I open up a patient's chart, uh, these are the things that I'm looking at. I already reviewed the medical profile and how we look at the entire aerodigestive tract. What um, are the comorbidities? And then also, what has that child been able to eat? So has this been dysphagia that was diagnosed at birth? Or is this are these symptoms occurring after a brain tumor resection or a trauma? So that that child then had a bunch of feeding experience prior to uh, meeting with me. It's all a completely different picture um, at how I'm able to drive the plan and really partner with the families to make sure that we um, have a liberal plan that also is keeping in mind pulmonary hygiene. Uh, so uh, always looking at when I see the patient, what is their baseline status? So if a patient is diagnosed with RSV and they're in the hospital, they already have inflammation in their airways and might be on a higher level of oxygen. So that has to be considered. I'm not going to want to do an MBSS or a fees at that time because they're more likely to be aspirating. So things that we know like that, we can try to time as therapists so that we are getting a good clinical picture of the patient at their best and not assessing them at their worst and putting a diagnosis in their chart that might hinder their future pathways of therapy and interventions. 
um, clinical presentations in terms of their tone, their sensation. Infants typically don't cough. They don't have a good uh, consistent reflexive cough those first couple months of life. And so looking at overall where they are in terms of their tone, their oral motor function, and also keeping in mind with those little, little ones that their lungs are still developing until the age of five and even past then. So they're really vulnerable um, to have insults in those early time periods. And another thing to add about infant lungs is oftentimes it won't present as aspiration pneumonia for our young infants because their alveoli are so tiny um, and their lungs are still developing that more often than not, they may be taking insults, but we may not be able to capture what that means for their long-term pulmonary health. Uh, and then lastly, we're looking at the quality of feed as we're um, you know, taking the information from the chart and looking at the child as they're eating. How does that look? Are they engaged in the feeding process? Are, is their state control um, adequate? Are they able to endure? Our cardiac babies can endure a full feed because um, they're set at a physiologic disadvantage. So looking at all of those components. And then this last slide I wanted to um, use just to highlight that there is an index of suspicion with every unique child and situation. And so we can gauge this from low to high risk. And if they're at a lower risk, we might be more liberal with their feeding plan, particularly if they're having, if it's an infant and it's breast milk, or if they're um, older and they can do a lot of free water. We know based on research of adults that free water does help. Uh, we wanna make sure to keep that oral flora free of bacteria prior to doing that, but it might be more advantageous than using a thickener. And I don't have enough time to go into that discussion right now, but anything that's more viscous, has a higher bacterial load, or just has more weight is more difficult for that, um, that clearance of the material from the lower airways. And so I like to use this just to highlight when we're thinking about aspiration, if a patient's aspirating, let's say after 10 minutes of breastfeeding, what does that mean for me? Am I going to say that this patient can't breastfeed? There's no, there's no way clinically I would say that. And so it's looking at all of these considerations and um, really talking it through with the family and the medical team to make a good plan. Thanks so much, Katie. So I think once, um, um, as a physician who takes care of hospitalized children, I think a lot about um, aspiration and also um, I think about it more on sort of the treatment side. So um, one of the challenges that we have um, as um, clinicians is that we don't really have any clear treatment guidelines for aspiration. And so we recommend different things based upon our, our best um, um, evaluations and working with the families. So we have, you know, therapies that are less intense that maybe they're aspirating their um, oral, oral secretion. So we, um, you know, give glycopyrrolate or botulinum toxin injections. We might give anti-reflex medications, um, but those aren't without their um, without their adverse effects. Um, you know, glycopyrrolate thickens the secretions, but that makes it harder to clear. Um, some of we know that um, acid suppression can be associated with um, increased risks of potential pneumonias, and um, that's been shown at least in other trials with older um, patients. And then we can move to sort of moderately intensive things like feeding therapy or adaptive feedings where we um, give patients feedings therapy, which requires them to have to come regularly for visits. Um, we may even use a nasogastric tube, which um, I'll call moderate um, because it doesn't actually cause, create an incision. And if it's uh, dislodged, it can be replaced pretty easily. And then we move to more you know, intensive therapies where we talk about feeding tubes where we do a potentially a gastrostomy tube with maybe with a Nissen, which uh, maybe we um, pass the pylorus in the stomach and put a gastrostomy jejunostomy tube. And then there's even airway surgeries that are um, done for patients who are having really severe aspiration, particularly those um, who are at highest risk. But because we don't have any clear treatment guidelines, um, we, we, we do work to individualize it with the families, but it's hard to provide clear guidance about which ones are the most effective at a, at a higher level. You know, I work a lot with complications and not just like our treatment for our aspiration may be varied. We don't have common diagnostic criteria for our um, complications. So I think a lot about aspiration pneumonia. And really in my mind, I feel like aspiration pneumonia tends to be a pneumonia that's in a child with multiple complex chronic conditions. So, 
um, a patient who's not otherwise healthy who comes in with a pneumonia, there's a concern for aspiration because they um, um, have had a swallow study in the remote past that showed that they aspirated. And so they get a label of aspiration pneumonia. And this chart just demonstrates the um, cadence of um, aspiration pneumonia diagnoses um, in the, um, the United States. And it sort of follows the winter pattern where in the winter they go up and in the fall they go and summer they go down, which is what we see with um, community acquired pneumonia. So is aspiration pneumonia a distinct, um, um, a distinct entity in most children or is it just what we term as pneumonia in a, and otherwise children with medical complexity? Or is aspiration pneumonia just a term that we use in a child, a sicker child who has multiple complex chronic conditions? So Dr. Thompson from, and her colleagues from Cincinnati did a study that showed that um, patients who were diagnosed with um, aspiration pneumonia had higher rates of complications than those who um, were not diagnosed with um, aspiration pneumonia. And this is in children with neurological and impairment. And so the children with aspiration pneumonia were sicker, but um, this is retrospective. So is this just due to the fact that we call aspiration pneumonia um, something different in children with um, multiple complex chronic conditions? The, the challenge is, is that the term aspiration pneumonia then leads to recurrent broad spectrum antibiotic use, and um, there's really not um, clear benefits. So um, Dr. Hirsch and colleagues um, did a paper that looked at aspiration pneumonia um, in hospitalized children using the Pediatric Health Information Systems data set. And what you can see is um, the boxed uh, antibiotics are, are fairly broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, in the ampicillin salbactam or unison, we have clindamycin and piperacillin tazobactam or zosin um, being used in aspiration pneumonia quite frequently um, compared to those who were um, hospitalized with what we call community acquired pneumonia. And so these are broad spectrum antibiotics that we know have um, um, long term effects on the gut microbiome and um, have higher rates of um, C. difficile infections and diarrhea. So you know, what we call something is important because the antibiotics that we're going to use to um, treat it may be different. Um, and then this is just some work from Dr. Thompson's group, again, really looking at the variation in antibiotics for aspiration pneumonia in children with neurological impairment. And each color represents a different um, classification of antibiotics. But you can see that um, there's very, very high rates of um, um, anaerobic coverage, which covers a lot of our oral flora. And these anaerobic antibiotics have really broad spectrum, um, can have really broad spectrum uh, treatment and therefore can cause adverse effects as well. And the really big question is, uh, does this large variation in administered antibiotics really change the outcomes? And um, in this one study that Dr. Thompson did, there, were, um, there was some evidence uh, uh, retrospectively, that um, those who received anaerobic coverage um, did have um, decreased rates of um, adverse events. So the boxed uh, the boxed uh, figures are the ones that for patients who did not receive gram negative and um, um, I'm sorry, did not receive anaerobic coverage. So everything to the right means you had a higher likelihood of having an adverse outcome. Um, so this, the study did suggest that potentially those who did not receive anaerobic coverage may have had higher rates of respiratory failure, ICU transfer, and length of stay. But because it's retrospective, um, although there were, question, there were improved outcomes with antibiotic anaerobic coverage, um, the, really the nature of the study made it difficult to, um, uh, to, to state that there was more than an association, that there was actual causation. So interestingly, um, in 2000, um, I think, believe 2020, adult guidelines actually removed um, the recommendation for coverage for aspiration pneumonia in adults who, unless they had an, uh, uh, signs of an, a clear aspiration event, which included a, a complication from that, um, including a lung abscess or an effusion or empyema. So they, um, again, there's not really very, there's not really great evidence. This is very low quality of evidence, but um, based upon their expert opinion, it was removed from the adult guidelines for impaired treatment. So the question is, what do we need to do for children? And I'm gonna close just by talking a little bit about um, from the family perspective and the physician perspective. I, I feel like a lot of times when we talk about aspiration, there's what I call therapeutic momentum. 
So somebody gets a child gets diagnosed with aspiration and we maybe do some interventions, but eventually they get up. So many of them get a feeding tube placed. Um, that feeding tube then gets dislodged inevitably. Um, and then as clinicians, we are as a team, we replace the feeding tube. And then we get concerned that they come in with another pneumonia because they had an aspiration pneumonia and they come in with another pneumonia or aspiration event. And then that feeding tube gets sort of more intense. So it changes from a G tube to a uh, transpyloric tube, or we do another intervention. And then the cycle sort of continues. So one thing I want to say is once, I think often once a feeding tube is placed, if it's dislodged, we often reflexively replace it. So really reevaluating the continued need for transpyloric feeding tubes or feeding tubes at all once it comes out. So just asking yourself, does the patient still need this level of, of um, intervention? Can we deescalate it a little bit? Um, and then again, once you're diagnosed with an aspiration pneumonia, you're more likely to be diagnosed with it in the future. So that's just my opinion, but it's sort of therapeutic momentum. So I, I wanna leave time for questions and um, uh, just concluding that the risk benefit analysis always has to be considered for diagnosing aspiration because as Katie said, swallowing is practice and you have to achieve these milestones to be able to do it. And the risk benefit may differ to, based upon the underlying conditions, particularly their lung, um, their lung conditions. And this optimal evaluation and management of aspiration does require access to some specialty care, which is not available equitably to everybody. Um, and I'm gonna push that we need perspective um, studies on aspiration in children and its complications because right now we're just, um, we don't have that evidence. With that, I'll end and um, thank you for your time. Thanks, uh, Dr. Russell and Katie. I, I, I thought that was fantastic. The, you know, very, uh, just to point out a theme that's come out quite a lot in the series, um, the, some of the issues with the lack of knowledge is actually definitional vagueness um the uh siloization of the clinical issue to inpatient or outpatient settings to medical management therapeutic management and as katie nicely alluded to even the whole developmental aspects of it so i thought it's an excellent overview of a lot of uh important issues i want to pass back to um to kathy at this point um to uh you know provide again the uh the lived experience perspective on aspiration uh, that she began to um, that she, mm -hmm. she began to share with us, and also to give her an opportunity to comment on what she just heard. So, Kathy, I hope your uh, um, connection is okay now. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Loud and clear. Happy to have you okay, back. Okay. Great. <laughs> great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, um, I I, list, I enjoyed listening to your presentations because it very much mirrors our journey in terms of um, level of intervention and trying to um, start out, you know, with the the least restrictive, and then you know, ultimately ending up with a D tube. Um, Nathan also struggles with managing the saliva in his mouth, so we do periodic Botox injections to try to decrease that um, he's a very oral kid. He's constantly wanting to put things in his mouth. And, you know, if it's a small object, it's obviously a token hazard. And I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that he has such a decreased sensitivity in his oral cavity. Um, and he loves to eat. I mean, now that we have over the years work with so many different SLPs and graduated to the level where he is taking um, purees he'll take um like guacamole and hummus and a whipped cream cheese he can eat that sort of a consistency um and sometimes a honey thick liquid as well by mouth he he enjoys the experience of eating so much um and doesn't tend to show any sensory aversions to the experience at all so at this point in our journey we just kind of resolve to the fact that he eats for pleasure um, and, you know, have made that a part of, you know, just his social experience of sitting down with dinner with a family. And, um, you know, it kind of grosses out my other son a little bit because it's a complete mess when he eats. But, um, you know, it, it is for him, I think, um, very enjoyable, but he does need that tube for his full nutrition. And um, I, I think I've kind of come around to accept that as really contributing to his overall health as well, because I can control what, what goes in it. 
Um, we live in Texas in the summer. It's super, super hot. And so I can keep him hydrated by, you know, adding free water to it. He also um, has dysautonomia. And I think keeping him hydrated since he doesn't sweat, um, you know, helps manage that um, as well. And then um, we use a uh, nourish peptide, which is this, um, it's um, organic, gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free. Um, and we joke that he eats more healthy than we do. Um, and so I've, I've seen developmental gains just because of his diet through the tube too. Um, so it's been, um, I think overall, um, a really really huge um, advantage to to have the tube even though initially it was it was a huge barrier for me to overcome as his mom um, and, and what I've learned just about um, you know watching for when he's aspirating there are meal times where we'll, we'll take it away because he's struggling to swallow and he just can't um, he's, he's just discoordinated and he can't get it down the right way. Um, but I've over the years kind of noticed um, in the the special needs um, medically fragile community, um, interacting with other kids um, at his school, noticing like, hmm, I think that kiddo might be struggling with aspiration. And even recently, um, a friend of mine whose son has the same syndrome said, hey, the school reached out to me and they wanted to know if, you know, if my son always eats this way and they think something's going on. And, um, and I think it just kind of underscores the fact that, you know, when you take your child into the clinic, you're not always getting a full picture of, um, of, of their health. And in, in other words, you're not sitting down in the kitchen and watching them eat a meal. And so um, our journey was very much one where from the beginning, we knew it was a problem and we had medical professionals following us all the way through it. But it's hard to identify, I think, sometimes those families that are out there that it, it might be happening, especially if you don't have um, aspiration pneumonia showing up. And Nathan, Nathan's only had one aspiration pneumonia. But, um, you know, those cases where it can kind of become normal to you as a parent, you know, you, you hear them kind of throat clear, or you hear a gulp when they swallow, um, to always know, you know, that something is going on. Um, and so it's hard, I think, um, as parents, because in speaking with this other mom too, she doesn't want a G-tube and I get it. I was there. Um, and, and it, 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 in some ways it can make your life more complicated, but in other ways, um, it can make your your life easier. So um, I think I think for Nathan, um, we've kind of hit our stride um, with him with with aspiration. And I do I do see as he develops too, and as he grows, um, he's he's getting better. He's eating more volume by mouth, and we haven't had to increase his caloric intake through the tube. Um, so. So there is some, there's some gains, you know, I mean, I think you can see a lot of times, you know, all of the hurdles um, and see regressions, but, you know, there's also steps forward as well. So that's kind of, that's kind of our story with it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to now uh, open up for discussion amongst the panelists. Uh, and maybe give uh, Katie and Chris a chance to reflect on um, on what they just heard from Kathy about her experience with her son, Nathan. Uh, I would like to comment on Kathy. Thank you for bringing up how in the home environment and, uh, you know, as caregivers, you know your child best and you see Nathan throughout the day where he may be having good meal times and at other times being a little bit more tired and not looking as safe. I always let families know that one, especially if I'm feeding a baby, I'm not feeding as well as the parent will. I, I specialize in dysphagia. I've been doing this over 20 years, but I won't feed your child as well as you will. So I try to early on, and I don't know if that was your experience, allow the family to be do it, be part and be also feeding as early as possible to, you know, empower, uh, you know, 
the caregivers to know that they are the best at this. Nobody can take that away from you. Your child's been hearing your voice and smelling you for months in gestation, and, you know, so um, I think that's an important point. And it's also an important reflection for us to remember when we are scheduling instrumental assessments that are going to maybe identify something going wrong, that we're doing that at a time that's optimal for your child and that you're letting us know when that time is. Yeah, I think I just yeah. wanted to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think that's an excellent point. And I think that, um, you know, if finding the right um, SLP who is going to listen to what your goals are for them too. Not that as a parent, I wanted to feed him when he was unsafe. I just wanted help and I wanted a vision for getting him to a place where he could experience the enjoyment of eating and to try things and, and push him a little bit further. Um, because I, I think a lot of the medical and professionals that I encountered were, they just wanted to be so cautious because they didn't want him to get sick. And I didn't either, but I, I didn't want to, like I said earlier, give up on him. And so it's finding that balance and that right partnership, I think, too, with a provider who sees where you want to go. And even if you can't get there yet, is willing to like stick it out with you to develop a plan to see if you can get there. Um, because the, I think the, the worst thing as a parent when you have a kid with medical issues is to regret not trying something, you know, um, and if it doesn't work, then, then that's that. But, you know, if it does, then great, you know, you had a, a big win. I wanted to reflect a little bit um, on the thought about the, the G-tube feeling like families and caregivers feel like they're giving up. And I think that that's something that I've heard a lot. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as clinicians to, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, first that these tubes are not permanent and we can allow people, you know, we actually may decrease the um, anxiety and the, the tension in the household about feeding. And um, sometimes can, um, that relaxation can, um, Sort of amplify and speed uh, and improve, um, you know, oral intake in some children, and so, um, and I think I have talked to a number of families who have had that hesitation, and then um, the feeding tube gets put in, and then there's this relief that now they can focus on like long-term um, gains in in those development in terms of feeding, rather than focusing on making sure that um, at he, he, the child's taking enough by mouth um, and. Uh, so I just I want to reflect that that's a really challenging thing to have to feel as a as a caregiver that um, and I think we need to do a better job about explaining our rationale and that how we're our, and what our plan is to to go back to what is um, the the optimal the family centered way if that's possible. And just to pivot on that too, oftentimes in the decision making process, it's um, the family sharing that same um, thought, but also that it means we're not going to work on oral feeding or that there's going to be less of a drive to work on oral feeding. So from mm -hmm. the beginning, I try to emphasize that in no way where the tube lies, whether it's in the nose, in the stomach, it doesn't matter. You, your, your goal is to you know, partner with the family and get that child to whatever you know, level of intake that is safe and um, will help them develop. And so um, I also try to emphasize that because I know that's something that is often brought up. And there's a lot of healthcare related questionnaires that can be asked of caregivers. Um, we do it with our home NG program um, so that we can capture how caregivers are feeling about the decision to leave with a nasogastric tube. And it um, helps to capture whether or not they're getting sleep, what their stress level is, because as the caregiver you're taking on, a lot of new medical literacy and demand. And, um, and of course you, you're doing it because you want to do everything for your child, but that goes at an expense to your own health. And so as providers too, we need to look at both aspects of the dyad and, and really take into consideration how that's impacting the family. Thanks guys. I, I'd like to um, pivot to the Q&As because there's a couple of uh, really good ones to get the ball rolling. Uh, there's a question, then there's a comment. So let's 
if it's okay, I'd like to read the question and uh, get the panelist's perspective on it. So it's a question from Matthew Smith. Thank you for the presentation. I often worry about the clinical significance of aspiration in some of my patients. Am I really preventing long-term lung damage or recurrent pneumonias in my child with more subtle silent aspiration on uh, modified barium swallow study, that's MBSS, by forcing two feeds? Is there any guidance on how to better understand which of my patients with aspiration on their barium study are really at risk of these outcomes, which we are trying to prevent? Excellent question. I can start with that one. Um, so there is, uh, as I um, was suggesting, very little evidence in pediatrics, and it's very hard for us as providers, whether we're the therapist or you know the, the feedback we're getting from the medical team to pair together. Um, we do know that um, you know liquid going into the airways that are developing cre can create um, future lung difficulties, and there's been a few studies looking into that, but not in our young, young ones. So um, those bronchioles and, uh, you know, having liquid in them, that if it's not breast milk and it's not easily, you know, getting that mucociliary um, clearance, it, it's ca causing some hardening of the walls and will create uh, narrowing. And so those kinds of things we know, and I'm sure Dr. Russell can speak better to that, um, certainly not a pulmonologist, but um, those things we do know. So it's overall risk where the aspiration is just one component and looking at all the comorbidities, the family's needs and desires and um, coming up with a plan. I think there's a risk benefit to all of this and talking to the family about what what their goals are. I think that's where, and also um, working closely with our therapists to see what is the act, like what is the degree of penetration into the airway. Um, is it a we're concerned about them aspirating, or we have at least evidence, like objective evidence that they're doing? And I think I, a lot of times I see this concern for aspiration that is the reason why we we move to these more um, intense um, interventions rather than an actual um, clear objective evaluation. And I think too, on the flip side, what I get sometimes is when I'm um, feeling a little bit more liberal because of the overall clinical picture and the family's um, goals in the case, is fear of providers that uh, a brewy or a brief um, unresolved event happens um, where there's laryngeal spasm in result of something entering the airway. Uh, and so that slows down the plan. And that's hard too, from a provider standpoint, when we have an instrumental that's suggestive that there's aspiration, but that we're okay with liberalizing for a certain volume or amount. And then um, there's that concern, which is, is definitely, something that we should be considering. Um, I know there's a study by Boston Children's looking at that, and mostly that was due to reflux when they um, looked at all of the data. So um, just another point of consideration. I'm gonna move on to uh, a comment by the always thoughtful Julie Hauer, who is one of our presenters in this series. So thank you, Julie, for joining today as a participant. And she, uh, she makes the point, I wonder about the risk attributed to aspiration of saliva being overstated. I wonder if the attention reflects the ability to measure, yet that the comorbidity, and I think this comes to the point that Dr. Russell was making, may have an, uh, as large a role on, uh, or greater impact on those with ongoing decline. I worry about parents who are conditioned to constantly suction out of fear of their child aspirating saliva. There seems to be a lack of evidence that demonstrate long-term benefit from interventions to prevent aspiration of pneumonia, uh, aspiration of saliva. All of the presenters were wonderful. Thank you for the expertise from all. So i um, interested in uh, Kathy or, or Dr. Russell or Katie, any of you have any, any comments on, on, what the, on what Dr. Howard mentioned on the concept of potentially overthinking about particularly aspiration of saliva? I, think I might ask you to comment as a parent, just like what the discussions you've had with the various teams that have taken care of, um, of Nathan. I was curious to hear what your thoughts are about that. 
Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, Nathan only had one aspiration pneumonia. And so, um, over the course of time, we, we really felt like when he did aspirate, we weren't as concerned that it was going to make him sick. Um, and I think as far as the saliva goes and, and just that being an issue, I, the reason we do the Botox for him, um, is, to help him not be as distracted with what's going on in his mouth because he'll stick his hand down there all the way to his knuckles to try to help himself swallow his saliva back down. Um, and then if he has too much saliva, then he, he's not really as coordinated to eat his purees either. Um, so it, it, that's kind of the, the reason why we try to manage the amount of um, secretions that are going on in his mouth. We don't tend to suction him, um, you know, unless he's sick and then it, it, you know, it's really copious and really difficult for him. Um, but really the, the, the reason why we try to dry out his mouth is just to, to help him, um, you know, be able to swallow and eat and, um, and, and be able to focus, like, especially at school, not always have his hand in his mouth, but to be able to participate a little bit more. I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah. And just to add to that, certainly suctioning creates more trauma to the, um, to the area and creates more secretion as a result. Uh, what we've been doing in our aerodigestive center too, is for non, um, or the children that don't eat anything by mouth but have poor secretion management, we actually do fees for the utility of, and that's the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation swallow, just to look at what the severity of those secretions are, kind of gauging what, you know, where they're hanging out in those pockets within the back of the throat area, the follicular, the piriform sinuses, um, if it's dumping into the area, in, into the airway. Um, also looking clinically at cough, cough is so important for uh, pulmonary clearance. And if, you know, you can cough and swallow more, you're getting more swallow practice. So uh, depending on the ability of a child to follow commands, so that's something also that we do. So wondering if, uh, before I get to the, there's the questions are coming uh, uh, into the Q&A box, and I'm going to try to get to all of them today. Um, I just want to ask something quickly about uh, what Kathy presented. So Kathy, you presented that you're um, that your son had been, Nathan had been uh, uh, trialed with Vitastim. I was wondering if you can comment a little bit uh, on your experience with that, how the how it was presented to you, and maybe from the other panelists, if they have any thoughts on, the, uh, on, on that. Because again, we've been talking about evidence and what there's evidence for in this area, and that's a, a therapy that I've been seeing used a lot. Yeah. Um, so when I first heard about vital sim as a thera therapy, I was immediately interested in it. It's sometimes hard to find a therapist who is trained and able to do it. And so um, once we found somebody who was willing to try it on him, he was probably maybe 18 months old or so. And um, I was expecting these like amazing results. Um, they didn't happen like that. Um, doing it in short bursts of time, I think, is what the, the recommendation was. Like uh, the first therapist that we worked with, I think she was doing them like in six week um, seg like sessions. And we would have to do them for a minimum of two times a week. Um, and we even tried to bump them up to three times a week, which was a bit of an insurance issue. But um, to try to, to see some gains. When he was younger, I honestly didn't see a ton of improvement, but um, even as late as last fall, we were doing a round of vital stim and, um, and I, I did see some improvement just in terms of, um, I think again, those secretions and being able to manage those secretions I think I think it did help with that um and and I would go back to it again I think there's like seasons that we go through where we work on eating more than others and and right now we're not doing any feeding therapy we're working mostly on his AAC device you know I mean there's so so much you need to work on with a medically fragile kid and um 
And so, um, but yeah, I, I do think the vital stim was helpful in his case in, in different seasons. Um, it has been more helpful than others. Thank you. Any, any other comments on vital stim from the panelists? This is a very hot topic. Um, and so thank you for mentioning. Uh, there's definitely a recent study um, that showed that there isn't statistical significance when they looked at whether it was a control group of vital stim versus a control group with um, therapy working on, you know, muscle activation, just traditional therapy. And it wasn't significant. I don't do this in my practice, but I never tell families not to do something um, if they you know, I, I can't say that I wouldn't do everything and anything um, to try to help, but it's not based in the research. So I don't personally practice using it. Um, and so really what the literature that we do have out there um, tells us is that you have to use your muscles. So the dosage of therapy when you're doing um, NMES or vital stim is usually higher as Kathy alluded to. So I think, you know, what you can extrapolate is if you're going to get higher dosage of therapy per week, you're going to show better gains, whether or not that's the electrode or not. Um, you know, it, it just hasn't been shown in a large enough sample size that I am um, committed to doing it with children. And I also in therapy practice always like to keep everything as natural as possible. So you're working on mealtime routine, you're working on, you know, everything surrounding um, food intake with electrodes on which some children it's uncomfortable, or they have skin integrity issues. So again, risk benefit ratio is how I'll leave that. And just for those of us who don't know acronyms, what does NMES stand for? It's neuromuscular electric stimulation. It's vital stimulation with a fancier, longer term. <laughs> I want to move just, on. To, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to point out that these therapies are, the challenge with all of these therapies is that they're inconsistently available at different places. And, mm -hmm. um, and even if they were to show benefit, um, it's, I think, um, talking about insurance coverage and the ability to actually get these things covered may be challenging, so. Um. Excellent point. I just want to move to some of the questions in the Q&A. So here's a question, and maybe I'll start with Dr. Russell for this one, uh, from David Hall. Hi, David. Uh, in the adult world, there's evidence that patients on uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, so like reflux medications are more likely to develop aspiration pneumonia. One possible explanation is that these medications increase the bacterial flora in the stomach. Um, historically, we use anti-reflux medications like PPIs, again, proton pump inhibitors, to reduce the pH um, and uh, result in the irritation of aspirated contents to the lung. But I wonder if this is the really the best thing. So wonder if uh, you or any of the other panelists have any comments on reflux medications, um, whether to, to, to prevent aspirations and or whether they, um, uh, a side effect of them maybe to promote aspiration. Um. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I did a, did a literature review on this, you know, in the distant past, but there, there is clear evidence, I think in adults, as, um, um, as was said, that they're, um, they're, they're more likely to develop, I'm not sure if it's aspiration pneumonia or it's just community, they're more likely to be um, develop a pneumonia. And I think that the concern is that um, these medications are you know, over the counter and they're fairly, they're termed to be benign. And so people are utilizing them for reflux and for other um, conditions. And in children, um, you know, thinking about the different medications, um, you know, we're trying to prevent that irritation, but I agree. I think we need to think about what are the other effects that these medications may have. Um, and uh, I, there are some studies, um, not, uh, not, not, you know, mostly randomized, you know, prospective trials, but that have demonstrated that um, acid suppression is associated with pneumonia in children. So I think we just, again, it's, it's not that some children don't benefit from aspir um, from acid suppression, but it's a tr you know thinking about is it a trial like just like a feeding tube like maybe we feed, you know as we're working on oral feeds and we're working on um, improving motility we have them on the medication and then we reevaluate the continued need for those medications as we're moving forward. 
Thank you. Any other comments from other panelists? We have other great questions as well. Here's another one. I'm going to uh, read out the question from, Shelley Gatt, from Sheila Gatz. And this is about another thing that is done quite frequently in, in, in the care of these uh, children and a question about how it may affect aspiration. This is on nasogastric tube feeds. I've often heard that a baby child having, having a nasogastric tube place makes them more susceptible to aspiration due to the tube. Is this true? How do you teach your par parents how to check NG placements? Do you use pH testing? So there are multiple parts to this question. Maybe we'll start with the first one. And then if, if anyone wants to comment on, on teaching um, at any point, that would be helpful too. So NG tubes and aspiration. Um, so the, I always tell a family, and I'm interested to see what Dr. Russell said, says, but um, the, the actual tube is an object that's stenting open the upper esophageal sphincter. So if there's significant reflux, that leaves that opening, but I, I don't um, communicate or message that that tube is going to create aspiration in any way. We emphasize that it's short term in that four, in four to six months, we would um, want to have that indwelling tube out just because of you know, risk of infection and pulling it and it looking more long-term, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And then checking placement, we don't use pH papers because it, we just actually switched our policy here. Um, it depends on the pH in the um, stomach and if they're on certain medications, it's not accurate. So um, we do gastric content um, checks uh, with our NG2 placement. So. Yeah, I think the only thing that I'll, I'll add is, um... I think, you know, like any other intervention, a nasogastric tube has risks. And um, I think at, at least at our institution, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about sending children home with nasogastric tubes, not just for aspiration from stenting open um, the, the sphincters, but also accidental dislodgement and then um, contacts going directly into the lungs. So I think you have to, um, we have strict, you know, rules about how we, you know, you know, I, what we recommend for families about how they're being fed, continuous versus bolus, you know, things like um, um, with the tubes to ensure that they're monitored while they have the feeding tube in place and are getting fed so that it doesn't get dislodged. Um, I think um, we have a program at our hospital that teaches families um, through our family resource center, which is sort of like our family education center that does um, a lot of education with our families about um, um, nasogastric tubes, how to check it's in the right place, um, how to utilize it, um, and then um, and then sort of they practice um, they practice utilizing it as well with sort of mannequins. Kathy, do you have any comments? Did you did you ever experience a nasogastric tube with Nathan? We did in the NICU, um, and we discussed going home with the NG tube. But my fear of him pulling it out and then us having to redrop it down into the right placement um, was the reason, primary reason why we didn't. And the other was once I started doing research and once I started discovering how many of these kids with Creutzfeldt syndrome have G tubes, I I felt like the writing was on the wall, and so that the other reason why we just opted for the G-tube placement instead. And I will say, um, our, we did have doctors who said to us, this isn't permanent. Um, and that, what, that was helpful to hear too, just that this is like the next step. It's not, we're deciding forever. Um, and so that did help make the decision to just go with the G-tube as well. It took away some of the anxiety. Thank you. Here's another good question from Allison Gage. Is there anything for that can be advised to clients who are at high risk for aspiration regarding sleep positioning to manage secretions? So maybe we'll start with Kate, with Katie on this one. I think, you know, from what I hear from our nurses, the literature has been going, uh, you know, especially for young babies, they need to be in a safe sleep position. Um, so you can't, we used to actually, even with the isolates or cribs, kind of elevate the back, but we don't do that anymore. Um, so I don't really have a great answer for that. Uh, Dr. Russell, do you? 
I don't, ex except for encouraging safe sleep pattern practices in general. Um, I think also a lot of this is it's you know you put someone to sleep. But I mean, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, someone goes to sleep and then they move, right? So a lot of these, um, a lot of these children, you know, you'll you'll place for bigger children, but I think for babies we need to go back to sort of back to sleep and and, and safe sleep patterns. Thanks. And Alyssa just put in the chat box uh, the video of our last session, an excellent session specifically on sleep. And um, uh, so turn your attention to that for further questions about sleep. Um, let's continue through the, the, the Q&As. They're, they're still coming. There's some great ones here. Um, someone asks, I'm seeing a newborn that coughs and gags, and it's so hard to tell what is immature suck, swallow, breathe versus, I guess, aspiration and trying to, and this is uh, from a visiting nurse is trying to understand whether that's an indication to notify the provider, any tips? Yeah, that's a, it's our frustration too as skilled clinicians is we don't know. And so that's when you have to do an instrumental assessment. Um, there's something going on there. Uh, if that coordination is not um, rhythmical and in sync and not re um, resulting in any of those stress signs or um, reflexes. So um, I would encourage a modified varying swallow study or a fees to determine uh, what's going on. There's a question whether any of you have any thoughts on oral facial therapy, OFM therapy. I don't know what the M stands for. So oral facial myology um, is a therapy that certain clinicians are trained in in order to do release of the muscles. And um, we don't do that here inpatient, uh, but there's tons of outpatient providers that uh, do that type of practice. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, here's a question from Adi Kadar, and this I think uh, uh, Dr. Russell alluded to a little bit in his talk, another one of the wicked problems in the management of aspiration is thoughts on transpyloric versus non-transpyloric, and this is about NJ versus NG specifically when concerned about reflux. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's NJ, it's transpyloric tubes, it's a gastrostomy tube with a Nissen, to, you know, um, and I think um, I, I go back to the family experience with all of these interventions and that sort of sometimes um, guides me. So I think there are times where transpyloric feeding tubes or feeding tubes that bypass the stomach are really helpful, um, especially when children who are having multiple reflux events or severe complications from aspiration. Um, I think, you know, a nasogastric tube compared to a na nasal jejunal tube um, in terms of uh, uh, does impact the families differently. So, you know, and, and in, a, in a gastric tube, we can do bolus feedings um, if, the, if the child tolerates it. Um, if the tube comes out of, um, we can replace it either, you know, if the family or the, the outpatient clinician is comfortable or they can come to the emergency room and, um, and get it replaced pretty quickly and then be discharged home. You know, committing a child to a nasogastric, I'm sorry, nasal jejunal tube, so a, trend, a, a feeding tube that passes the stomach um, is a different encounter because that means that the child is getting um, committed to continuous feeds um, not necessarily 24 hour feeds, but we can't bolus feed um, in the intestines. And so that means they're gonna be tethered to something for an extended period of time, which also impacts their, um, de their other development, right? Um, going to school, uh, going to your therapies, you know, uh, and then also if that tube gets dislodged, um, at least at our hospital, it requires um, usually uh, intervention by our radiologist to replace it. It's not something that I think most places can do pretty easily and quickly. It's certainly not something that can be done at home. Um, and I think even in the emergency room, it would be challenging at many um, hospitals. So I think, again, it's this, this, this benefit, like there is a huge impact um, and it does change sort of the everyday life for families um, when we have these transpyloric feeding tubes, but for some children, it does actually significantly decrease their hospitalizations. And so for pneumonia, and therefore the benefit of that might outweigh the, the challenges and um, associated with having a different kind of feeding tube. Here's a great question. Do swallow 
patterns change with age? Should swallow studies be repeated in a certain number of years? My son is 26 and three previous studies over the years have showed uh, no aspiration. I, I think I want to begin before before we anyone speaks, just to ask again, Kathy, your experience as your child had swallowing studies, what's that been like? Yes, he's had probably five of them over his last nine years. Um, we've we've kind of gone back and forth um, each time whether or not it's advantageous to do so. And usually the decision um, was made because there was some medical change to him that we, we wanted to kind of check and just see um, where he was at with it. Um, most, well, all of them showed that he was aspirating. Um, but I will say here, it's like a snapshot in time, right? So you go in and you get all checked in and it's kind of this artificial environment. And, you know, I bring food from home and they try to mix it up. And if he's just kind of thrown off by the environment too, it makes me wonder, you know, if we're really getting a good accurate read on how well his swallow is, because, you know, at home you like there's days where I don't hear gulping and I, I mean, it's just going down so easily and he's got his chin tucked. And so it's making it really easy for him to, to swallow. Um, so, and then there's always the concern of, you know, more radiology and he's already got so many other things going on constantly having to be exposed to that is a concern. Um, I, I, my experience has been that it's typically our speech therapist who's wanting that information in terms of knowing how to proceed with, you know, therapy goals and what to work on versus our PCP in particular always pushes back. Like what, what are we going to do with that information? Is it really going to change, um, you know, our approach to his, his care, to his treatment? Um, and so, I, I mean, I kind of have mixed feelings on him and um, I think we'll always have to you know, take it on a case by case basis to know whether or not it, you know, one is called for. Thanks, Katie. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that's so valuable how you shared your experience, Kathy, because we don't want to make a problem when there is no problem. And there's really no reason to go under fluoroscopy unless there's a change in status or concern, or let's say we're changing the mode of presentation or the texture, um, wanting to progress in that manner. And even that you can use the other information to really understand the biomechanics of swallow. To answer the overall general question, certainly swallow changes over time. Um, we, our swallow function degrades as we age. And, um, but if you don't have a neurologic uh, that's degenerative condition, uh, if there's no functional change, then there's no reason warranting, warranting repeat assessments. Uh, but the one nice thing about fees is you can do serial assessments and there's no radiation. So that's another option that we have now too, to get information about pharyngeal swallow uh, without that radiation exposure. Can I ask a question, sort of a follow-up on that? So um, is there a, a, Katie, is there a time where you repeat these studies to, uh, to sort of try to de-escalate the, 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 the in, sort of intensity of the therapy that they're getting? Or the, the um, so I had, a, I had a patient who, you know, when she was six months old, had an aspiration event, had a, a transpyloric feeding tube past the stomach placed and then was readmitted over the course of the next five years, you know, umpteen times for a, a replacement of that uh, deadunostomy tube. Um, and, you know, at five years old, she's a different child just in terms of size than a six month old. And so when, when do you sort of reevaluate that, um, not just to see if there's deterioration of it, but also progression, um, Yes, that's an excellent comment because that's that highlights our lost in the, our how patients are lost in the continuum of care. And if they they have that too for so many years, who is initiating a reassessment and um, going under fluoroscopy or whatever it may be? Um, I absolutely think that I try to encourage family members to be the best advocate because they know their child best. And if there are any changes or a lot of time have gone by or they're really driven to reinitiate feeds that they reach out to the PCP so that their physician can put it in order for reassessment. Um, but then on the flip side too, we don't want to 
be reassessing at a certain timeline. I've heard, you know, the question about, is there a certain amount of time to wait? No, it's more about functional change. It's more, more about change in the plan. Um, or like you said, if too much time's gone by, why are we not reinvestigating this cycle that you so nicely illustrated in your part of the discussion? We have one more question. Can we just do it quickly? I'm gonna just uh, reach out to Katie to try to answer this. It's a, because of your work in Air Digestive Clinic. Uh, there's a question about Golden Heart Syndrome. Uh, and a, uh, from a school nurse who's looking after a patient with a uh, malformation of the facial structure, including the jaw, who has a tracheostomy and a G tube, and will eventually need a laryngeal cleft repair uh, to remove the trach and G tube. Um, can can you can you uh, explain how the cleft might help uh, create a stable swallow airway pattern? I want to be a bit careful, not give specific medical advice around specific questions, but if any just general principles you want to highlight before we close. Yes, I mean, I know there's not a lot of time and this is a controversial one also, but for type one clefts, we have had a lot of experience just speaking from our institution um, with using a filler or an intervention just to help kind of build up that space in the back um, to help uh, with airway protection. Um, so again, the data is both ways, whether or not that's gonna make or break it that your child is going to be able to eat. Um, with Golden Heart Syndrome, there's a lot of structural anomalies that also are impacting that entire biomechanic sequence of swallow that I went over. So there's a lot to that picture than just uh, the laryngeal cleft. So on that note, this has been such a rich and wonderful discussion. So I wanna thank all our speakers today, Kathy, Katie, and Chris for joining us, for, um, for providing a wonderful seminar. And I hope everyone who's participated has enjoyed as much as we have. Just a reminder to complete your surveys. And again, you need to complete them by Tuesday, May 23rd to get your CME credits. Uh, and you'll get more information about that in the email. Just to highlight our, our last, very sad, our last seminar in the C6 seminar series is coming up on Thursday, June 2nd. And we're gonna close with a discussion uh, about, I think it's gonna be excellent about patient engagement and clinical research. We're gonna have Kara Coleman from Family Voices who has a lot of experience in this uh, speaking, Peter Rosenbaum, who's a clinician uh, researcher who's been doing patient-engaged research his whole career in cerebral palsy. He'll be speaking in Treby Brown, who's from the Division, uh, of, Service, uh, the Division of Services for Children's Special Health Care Needs at HRSA, will come and speak about uh, the whole role of patient engagement, clinical research from kind of a policy and funding perspective as well. Uh, so, uh, and on top of that, we'll have speakers from Family Voices, Debbie Harris and Kate Robinson. So I hope you all join that. You're gonna receive a registration link in your email. And on that note, huge thanks for everybody for coming and joining us today and for a rich uh, and meaningful discussion. Thanks everyone and have a wonderful day.